Today so. is Wednesday. Yeah. Week is going by slow for me. And welcome to the Reason and Theology Show. I'm your host, Michael Lofton. On a Wednesday evening, we're going to be discussing the legitimacy of indulgences, joined by Craig Truly, an Eastern Orthodox Christian, and Eric Ivara, a Roman Catholic Christian. Um, Craig, let's go ahead and dive in. Let me discuss with you first. Um, tell me what is your perspective on indulgences? What, what do you or how do you understand a Roman Catholic to uh, understand indulgences? What is their perspective in your understanding on indulgences? And then would you say that from your position, their perspective on indulgences requires an evolution of doctrine? Or would you say that there might be some legitimacy to the development there? It's great to, to be on tonight, and I apologize uh, to the viewers that I'm kind of exiled to the side of my bedroom. The rest of my house is being used right now, so you'll have to bear with the terrible aesthetics. Um, and those who are listening via MP3, they just have to use their imagination. So that being said, um, when it comes to indulgences, I could say this much. Um, like I have a book right here from Father Daniel Sezoyev, um, and he speaks of um, indulgences uh, as being a, uh, that Roman Catholics have been unable to stop from changing from church tradition. And, you're, and he includes that in a list of things. So it's the pretty standard Orthodox tradition, uh, Orthodox position rather, that uh, indulgences are not Orthodox. Um, and so the reason I start my response by saying that is only because, again, you know, I'm a layman. I'm not a theologian. I don't have all the answers to these things, but I, I believe I'm very solid ground saying Orthodox, uh, Orthodox do not believe in indulgences. Um, that being said, let me tell you best what I understand with the Roman. Well, actually, I'm not going to go into phrase, uh, frame the Roman Catholic doctrine as much as I'm going to take for what I read the Roman Catholic doctrine has and speak to how there really isn't any rough analogs in this in orthodoxy. Um, for example, the Catholic, the Roman Catholic uh, doctrine of purgatory um, posits that the reason purgatory exists is because there's the temporal effects of sins um, that are not always dealt with this, in, in this life. So for example, the eternal effects of sins are uh, forgiven um, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that's something Protestants, Roman Catholics, Orthodox would all agree about. Um, the issue more so then is, okay, in real life, right? God could forgive me for, God forbid, cheating on my wife. Um, but that being said, what are the effects, the temporal effects of that sin? A broken family, a lack of trust. Let's say no one ever found out. This conflict in my own heart. You know, different things to that effect. That there's temporal effects of sins in this world. Um, and sometimes full victory over those things are sometimes medically impossible. You know, like an STD or something like that. Um, however, as best I understand it, Roman Catholicism posits that temporal effects um, follow you after death. And there's just no analog for that within the Orthodox tradition, nor do I find that um, talked about or any dichotomy drawn between the temporal and eternal effects of sin in such terms in which then you would need a purgatory in the early church. Um, so there's a logic here, but it's a logic that doesn't seem to have a historical basis. Um, nor is it necessary in order to rationalize our prayers for the dead and, and things to that effect. Um, there's the, via, the idea of separation. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but this idea you hear of the excess of merits from the works of the saints and, of course, that of Jesus Christ, um, that they have more than enough merit than what they need to, you know, to be glorified. Um, so that means these extra merits can be transferred to someone with not enough. Um, so while in orthodoxy, we could give alms for the dead, we could pray for the dead, we could do good works on behalf of the dead and appease God. This is not understood in the orthodox tradition to mean that then that person attains to the merit of the, of 
of that person. Like they did excess meritorious acts and now that's transferred to them. Um, in an earlier video on Reason Theology, uh, people should put into YouTube a video called the Orthodox View of Merit. And, and uh, Mike and I went back and forth on this. And there's a good quote from St. Ambrose, because St. Ambrose, um, I believe it's on virginity, but he speaks of uh, virgins um, through their ascetic acts, um, attaining merit for their family members. Um, but then he, Ambrose goes a little farther than just leaving it there. He says, because it appeases God to be gracious to them. So instead of actually the other person getting the merit per se, as in he was lacking one, you had an extra one and you handed it to him, rather your merits appease God and then God is exceedingly gracious with that person. It's, there, it's a little more nuanced and different and, and it's less transactional um, than what I think we would get from the Roman Catholic viewpoint. Now, the Roman Catholic viewpoint as of present um, has a dichotomy bet between plenary and partial indulgences. So a plenary indulgence is that all the temporal uh, facts of sins, temporal punishment of sins um, are done away with um, via the indulgence, um, presuming a sincere conversion of outlook and unity with God, to quote a Roman Catholic doctrine uh, document on the issue. So you, for any indulgence to work, you need this sincere outlook. But the issue then is there's also partial indulgences, which just as equally need this sincere outlook. So what is the differentiator between the two? It's not the, let's say, whether it's going to mass once during the year of mercy or giving a million dollars in alms. Um, and whether it's a million dollars in alms and you're a billionaire or a million dollars and all you have is a million and one dollars. What is the differentiator between these two indulgences and quite frankly it's this arbitrary decision of whether it's plenary or whether it's partial with the idea that the bishop of rome and the roman catholic church could decide whether or not to lose a sin um this is a bigger issue which we're gonna need more to video to unpack and perhaps even a totally different video on again orthodox soteriology but Orthodox believe that we attain to a salvation and the effects of the atonement by being conformed to the sufferings of Christ. And so this idea that anyone could decide for the same act, this is partial or this is plenary, presuming the act is sincere, it's just not possible within, some frame, within such a framework. How could the priest um, say, um, well, I'm only granting you a partial indulgence for this act and, um, and that somehow reduces the effect of how conformed you are to Christ through the same act and same sincerity. There's just no orthodox, um, no orthodox paradigm to understand this with. It's just totally far from the orthodox mindset. And this is why, though it doesn't happen anymore, it was finally um, essentially illegalized in the Roman Catholic Church, I believe in 1567, but the sale of indulgences. Now granted a sale was always quite frankly, uh, just almsgiving, but the, again, because the bishop could arbitrarily decide whether the giving of those alms was of a partial indulgence sort of nature, which they used to call days or years back in the day. Um, now they're more vague, somehow that makes it better, or plenary, um, it didn't matter. As long as you gave the tone, they get to decide what, and obviously that gives you a lot of leverage in deciding what you're gonna give for a certain act and that led to its commoditization. So unlike, the, unlike people saying the sale of indulgence was an abuse, um, it really wasn't Roman Catholic. It's actually quite logical giving, given the system and the logic that's behind it. They weren't stupid when they were doing it. Um, lastly, and again, this in orthodoxy, we have almsgiving, but this idea that it's plenary, it's partial, that a bishop could just kind of decide and, and have that applied to you doesn't really have an analog. My last comment would be this, which would be just by the orthodox mindset, uh, indulgences would be unfair. And the reason they'd be unfair is like, let's just take a pilgrimage. I think we all agree that a pilgrimage is something that's a, in Western parlance, like a meritorious act. It's something that um, attains merit, to use Western parlance. Um, and so once we 
and now they go to the total Roman Catholic paradigm, pilgrimages could gain indulgences, especially certain acts and walking certain steps and, and seeing certain relics. And I think there, I forget where in Italy, but a certain stone you stand on um, where there's indulgences for these different pilgrimages. And the real problem with that is someone with a sincere conversion of outlook and unity with God, who's let's say in the Philippines will not be able to afford nor have the geographic proximity to attain to these indulgences, which are just this arbitrarily happen to be a lot in Italy and the Holy Land. And so to take something that's meritorious and then apply it to, well, it has to be done in this way for you to get an indulgence so the bishop could decide whether it's plenary or partial, um, it's just fundamentally unfair. And I would say, even if you look at Western churches in medieval times, and even Ethiopia, you'll see in a lot of these churches, they'll have, they almost have mazes and weird walkways. And scholars believe this is because it was a way for people that couldn't go to Jerusalem to, in a sense, in a sense, uh, by desire, partake in a, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, I forget which cathedral in France, but literally there's a maze in the floor as you walk towards the altar. And the idea is to go through this maze like it's a mini pilgrimage. So there seems to be this understanding that um, what we attain to in pilgrimage is of a spiritual nature, that we can even have these stand-ins from far away. Even in the Orthodox tradition, they have uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, but it's in Russia. And they just rebuilt the whole thing so people could do the same thing in Russia without going to the Holy Land. So I would actually say that is something godly, but the idea that no, it's this tangible pilgrimage gives you this exact indulgence, plenary or partial. And if, you know, when they were more honest in the 1960s and before, um, they'll tell you how many years, um, there's just no analog with, for that with an orthodoxy. So I know um, probably both of you guys are gonna try to poke holes. Oh, it's the wrong way to think about this or that, but perhaps a more helpful way of framing this issue would be Okay, what in orthodoxy is even remotely like this? What in the early church is even remotely like this? And I think once we answer those questions, we would have to say this is not only a development, it's pretty much a brand new doctrine. I mean, Protestantism is a development of centuries of, of Roman Catholic thought, but it's, we wouldn't say it's a development of anything legitimate and a clarification of something that already existed. It's clearly something new. Um, so... Um, I believe um, John Henry Newman even essentially said that much because I, I read an essay of his and it's just, you're really grasping at straws to try to find pre-schism um, analogs to indulgences. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm all ears. I'm just, from what I've learned, the little that I've read and uh, what I know about the Roman Catholic issue, but like I'd say, I'd be interested to hear what could possibly be very close analogs within the Orthodox Church and or the early church. Um, Eric, so we, what he, we essentially heard from Craig is that, um, you know, when it comes to the temporal effects of sin, we're not, you know, he doesn't see this as being biblical or patristic. Uh, so splitting out, you know, temporal and eternal effects of sin, merit, the sales of indulgences in the 16th century. Um, he doesn't see any kind of analogs to this in Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, does not see it as a development, sees it as an evolution. And would just basically basically liken it to the fact that Protestants would be a development of Western uh, theology. If you could maybe speak to those various points and any additional points that you wanted to take a stab at. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, well, I guess the first thing I would say is that um, the Orthodox Church has a a, a brief but substantial history of something akin to indulgences um, between the 16th and 18th century. And uh, if the readers want to expand on this, uh, you should pick up the book. It's called uh, The History of Athens. And boy, I don't know if I can uh, pronounce this, but Philip Ilios Sigorakartia. Uh, if you type in Philip Ilios, Ilios, uh, I L I O S, History of Athens, Volume One, uh, pages thirty-five through eighty-four, uh, it talks about uh, the the Eastern patriarchs uh, giving into some notion of absolution by a sum of money, 
and uh, this was actually sanctioned at a council in Constantinople in the 18th century as well. Uh, if you type in uh, Council of Constantinople 1727, you have uh, Greek, you know, Greeks, and uh, I don't believe I don't believe there was any Russian prelates at this one though. Uh, formally giving sanction to the idea of absolution certificates. And these certificates basically absolve one from sin. I don't know in particular whether that is for a delineated distinction between temporal or eternal effects, uh, but uh, they're certainly absolution certificates. And this was not seen as an abuse to the Orthodox tradition because even a, an expert in the Eastern tradition, such as uh, Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, you know, not only did he not oppose this, but he he gave formal traction to it uh, in a letter to Paisius, the Bishop of Staganos, uh, who was living in Constantinople. This letter was written in April 1806. He asks Bishop Paisios to get an absolution certificate uh, for a living monastic. Uh, and so this would be like a, an absolution certificate on behalf of the living. And um, it, it costs a certain amount of money. So there's some sources to look at here. If you, if you, if you just Google Eastern Orthodox indulgences uh, or absolution certificates, you will find the data that, that you would need to find where this comes up in the history. Um, now, the, in my personal research on the indulgences uh, as a theology, we have to distinguish between a problem with the theory and a problem with the reality. There are some people out there who will have no problem with the theoretical possibility of this indulgence machinery. In, in other words, it doesn't make uh, it doesn't internally collapse by some sort of uh, formal violation of logic or some fallacy that would make an internal collapse, for example. So they're willing to say that on the level of theory, it's not problematic. However, on the level of reality, does it correspond to any history in the Christian world uh, that would be anywhere close to being authentic or traditional or stemming from the true church of the first millennium, uh, they would say, no, that's certainly problematic. Uh, but uh, five points I've been able to nail down are, are how uh, basically chart the, the, th the theory of indulgences. So I'm just gonna read those five points. So one, all sin is an act which brings disorder into the ordered universe of the creator and as such it is deemed requisite in justice to repair this by some act of merit which comes through sacrifice loss pain or virtuous opposition to that disorder number two sin has a twofold punishment both eternal and temporary in the sacramental economy of the church, eternal punishment for sin is remitted by the power of the priesthood. But temporal punishment is left to be paid by the penitent member of the church, at least. Number three, the church, by virtue of her possession of the keys of the kingdom, can bind and loose the temporal punishment which is owed by each individual absolved member of the faithful, given the right conditions. Four, the grounds of justice which the church stands upon in order to liberally remit all of the temporal punishments or a portion of the temporal punishments due to sins is the treasury of merit. That's what it's called. It's been called that since at least the 13th century. Or a spiritual bank account which holds the infinite merits of Christ and the saints. Said treasury is a deduction from the mystery of the mystical body as a, com a communion. All members are individually members of one another, which makes for this uh, 
flow of exchange between the members to benefit one another and also in, in another sphere of, of orbit to, to discredit one another. Um, but this communion of saints makes for the ability of this exchange of goods from one to the other for the sake of the overall body's well-being. And number five, principally speaking, the Pope as the chief prime minister of the keys of the kingdom has the ability to make uh, transactions from the treasury of merit on behalf of the faithful given certain and, and proper conditions. So that is the theory. Um, now the history, where does this find any correspondence to church history? Well, we are not going to see any of this in particular until uh, the around the seventh century. And here's why. Uh, indulgences emerged from the economy of penance. And the way penance was done in the early church was you would enroll as a penitent if you committed a post-baptismal sin that was of a mortal nature that excommunicated you or some, some nature like that. You would enroll as a penitent and you would be given a certain amount of days, even years, outside of the church where you could not participate in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And you would have to go through a series of hierarchical stages in order to win your way back in. And you, that differs from how things ended up becoming towards the second turn of the second millennium where you received absolution right at the moment you confessed your sin. So today, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and uh, pretty much, I, I think this exists uh, for the Oriental churches now as well. When they come in confession, uh, there, there is absolution given either on the spot or there is some sort of remedial penance that may last a month or so. And then you come back and you receive absolution. That's not how it was in the early church. Um, Things were much more strict, stringent. There was schedules, there was rubrics, there was canonical procedure, there was books. Um, you enrolled in and your name was put next to a certain amount of years and you were monitored by a bishop, uh, sometimes helpers to the bishops who were monitored you and you were recommended sometimes for a shortening of days, but usually you'd have to do all your time. Well, um, in the third century, we see one of the first instances where this becomes, this gets a little hectic because you had some of the persecutions that uh, broke loose in the, in, uh, in, in the West and in the East, but particularly in the West, in North Africa and in Rome uh, and in the uh, areas of Gaul and uh, the, the, you know, the upper, upper West there, you had Christians who were basically uh, giving up the faith by turning uh, either either um, being willing to deny Jesus Christ, uh, their status as Christian, um, or giving up the books, the holy books that that you know sometimes were being excavated from the churches, and uh, they came in, stole vessels. Some of these people said, "Here are the vessels. Here are the books," and these people were excommunicated for that offense, and. And many times they, they wanted to come back to church the following week or the next two weeks, whenever they want to come back. And uh, they, were, they were outside of the church for quite some time. Sometimes they were given a lifetime uh, of, of excommunication. Well, uh, there, there came about this idea of these certificates of the martyrs, where these, the, the martyrs who actually did not give up the books or did not, did not give up their faith uh, in the in light in when they were confronted with persecution, but let's say they survived somehow. Maybe they were let free for some reason, or they were in, or they were being held captive. Some of these Christians were able to, uh, on a, on behalf of the excommunicants of the church, write up certificates which say, "I give my confession that I gave before the world of Christ as a meritorious satisfaction." for this person or that person. And that person would take those certificates, bring it to the bishop, and the bishop would say, okay, 
Um, at first, many were hesitant with this. Uh, we know from Cyprian of Carthage, he himself was uh, a bit hesitant about this, but even he conceded that this would work. And it wouldn't just be a transaction that was made spiritually from the martyr to the excommunicant. The bishop would have to impose his discretion on whether the merit of the martyr was going to take effect in the life of the excommunicant. And the excommunicant could be received back into communion with the church. So right there, you do see this idea of, of, of merit that's acting in a vicarious way uh, under the discretion of the ordinary, the bishop. Now, uh, there's several other elements to this. You know, Craig said that, you know, per Craig was really talking about indulgences for the dead, but um, that's that's only half of it. There's indulgences for the living. And that's really, you know, the, the emergence of indulgences were really basically for the living only. Um, but they were they did come in, uh, later for the dead. But his say, statement that the Orthodox Church uh, doesn't have anything remotely close to what we're saying about, you know, merit, vicarious merit on behalf of the deceased or the living. Uh, we see this in St. John Chrysostom. In, in my reading of Chrysostom, in my reading of St. Gregory the Great, if you read his dialogues, um, uh, chapters uh, 40 through 60, um, you'll see very clearly Gregory talks about people who die in mortal sin versus venial sin. And those who die in venial sin can receive absolution from our suffering, from our giving of alms, for our prayers at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, we also see this very clearly in St. Cyril of Jerusalem. If you read, I think it's the 23rd catech catechetical homily. Uh, the analogy he gives there is of a king who's being appeased in order to absolve certain criminals in the realm. And uh, it, it seems as though the, 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 the analogy, it, it, it fits well with what the Catholic would say. Um, so I, I think there's great patristic heritage for the concept of, what we're talking about here. The historical shoot off where it really comes into being is where is when absolution was given on the spot when somebody confessed and then they were given however many years to do their penance and they were able to receive communion through this whole process. This was a change that that was a change that took place. I want to say seventh, eighth, ninth century um, where people were able to come back to the, to the altar of God even before finishing their penance, but they still had the schedule of penance on them and somebody would be monitoring them, whether it was the deacons or the presbyters, whoever it was. Uh, and so you had a, a system, this, particularly in Ireland, you see this come out in Ireland with the Irish penitentials, where this idea of a commutative penance was done where, okay, you have another five years of penance to do where you have to, uh, on Friday, you can only eat bread and water, or you can't, you have to be on your knees all day on Sundays, whatever it is. If you pray 360 pastor notters, our fathers, we can reduce this down to one year. If you do this for six months, you start seeing this commutative tariff system. Uh, and and that that's for the living now. Uh, we see at the same time this happening for the dead. The Irish penitentials also talk about doing these pastor notters, and they even talk about flagellation uh, on behalf of the dead uh, in order to uh, release them from the bonds of death. And uh, this goes on. It, 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 it spreads. It doesn't get hindered. It doesn't get condemned. It doesn't get shortened. It doesn't get uh, refuted. It expands, it expands. And uh, we see this flourishing in the penitential system that uh, became more elaborated in the 12th century under certain Dominican thinkers. I can't think of the name of it immediately, but there's one Dominican thinker who's famous for coining some of the major terms that we use like treasury of saints or the treasury of, of merit. Um, but these were, this was not disputed, you know, those five, those five principles I gave are the theoretical foundations. Uh, the historical foundations, like I said, were slow in coming, but they're definitely there. What 
what troubles a lot of people is is the idea that there's this close calculable nature of it and 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 one of the things that needs to be reiterated is that indulgences on behalf of the dead when they're said in terms of days and years that's not uh, the the intention there is not to say that dead person a gets so many years off of suffering in the post-mortem atmosphere of death that's not what it means what it meant was that the equivalent of that many days or the 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 the, the satisfactory equivalent that one would obtain by enduring those many days of penance on earth are being accrued however it could possibly be to the satisfaction of the person in uh, suffering in purgatory. So it's not like the length of time is somehow breaking through time into the purgatory state. Um, the, other, the other second thing that needs to be remembered is that indulgences for the dead were never calculated. I mean, they were calculated, but they were done by way of suffrage. So if you read, like if you read the debate between um, jo, uh, uh, what, what's his name? Eck, yeah, Johannes Eck and Mark, Martin Luther, the Leipzig debate in 1519, um, the third week they talked about indulgences in that debate. Uh, I think Martin Luther brought up that issue like, oh, you know, you, you, why don't you just empty hell? Why don't, you know, uh, and uh, Eck responded by saying, no, indulgences for the dead have always been given by way of suffrage, uh, by modus suffragi, which means that uh, uh, there is Episcopal authority behind the Pope and the bishops, which say this indulgence would be for five years equivalent earthly penance for the deceased soul but it was given by way of suffrage meaning we hold it out to the father we hold it out to god that we desire this penance to amount to that much but it is up to god to decide what happens with it okay now there were some thinkers and some debaters who said well god would respect it because you know, the power this, the power of the Pope and the bishops is whoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So God listens to it, you know. But uh, what won the day and what the better scholars were saying is that that pertains to where the Pope and the bishops have jurisdiction, which is among the living, not among the dead. So that whole binding on heaven and earth thing only applied to the, the, the realm of proper jurisdiction, which was the living on earth. So the souls in purgatory were not in that jurisdiction. So it was only given by way of suffrage. Um, the other thing, last thing I want to say about the whole thing about unfairness, the unfairness of you know, people in the Philippines, uh, people in you know, Africa versus people in Jerusalem who had access to all these things. The indulgences were, were ways and aids for sinners to take the opportunity to cleanse themselves, to cleanse themselves of sin. Um, bishops in the Philippines would have every right to uh, institute their own. Um, in fact, they could have written to the Pope at any certain time when you know, there were so, certain fixed rules as this became more developed, it became more papally centered. Uh, so depending on what century you're talking about, they're just as free as the people in Jerusalem to, uh, to come up with ways to satisfy uh, as a commutative penance on for, for souls in their realm. So I don't see how that could amount to being unfair because the issue is open season, really, um, however much you might disagree with it. Well, Craig, what we've essentially heard from Eric among various points is you have the selling of indulgences or an equivalent, some kind of analog in Eastern Orthodoxy, at least for a certain period of time. You have the certificates of the martyrs out of which indulgence is developed. And then you also have a clarification on um, a very common misconception where if you see something that says you get 40, 40 days off purgatory or something, or I'm sorry, 40 days worth of an indulgence, it's not 40 days off of purgatory. It's actually basically 40 days of the equivalent of the old penitential system in the early church. So it had nothing to do with the time that you're getting off in purgatory. If you could maybe speak to those matters in addition to anything else that you wanted to uh, take, a, take a stab at there. 
I mean, yeah, it, it just sounds like centuries of dangerous rationalizations of very little basis in the church's history. Like, uh, for example, just saying a oh, bishop anywhere could do it, so it's fair when ignoring, obviously, most of these indulgences are given either whatever Pope Francis wants good PR and just gives them willy nilly, or you happen to be where they're more accessible, or you happen to have friendlier bishops where you are. I mean, I, it, let's say one country versus another country. I, I just think that's silly. Um, and it, at the root of this is the difference between Western and Eastern soteriology. The Western soteriology is obsessed with transactions. Um, just look at Protestantism, you know, Christ paid the full penalty for your sin. And so he gives you all his righteousness and it's this great exchange of righteousness and sin. And there's little talk about how we attain to Christ's righteousness through attaining to his suffering. Like we read, I believe it's Romans 8, 18. I know it's in Philippians chapter three, that we attain to the atoning effects of Christ's crucifixion by attaining to Christ-likeness, which is selflessness and self-effacement and, and um, suffering particularly, um, taking our cross and following him. So no system dressed up as much as you like with all the logic and, you know, syllogisms as you want to do replaces the fact that whether it is a bishop working with you or not, that through faith in Christ, conforming to Christ through suffering in the church is going to have the effects of applying the atonement on the individual. And that's for those who are living how they attain to salvation and how they avoid suffering after death, which the Roman Catholics call the effects of temporal sins, um, which is again, not an analog we find in the early church and not one I saw really defended. Um, let me address more specifically um, some of Eric's points. Um, and obviously in a short one hour video, we can't give too many details or definitely settle this answer, uh, this question. So um, use these things as a way for the audience to um, think more about this matter and study more and for us to just reflect on each other's positions. Like um, in an earlier video on this channel, the Orthodox view of merits, um, I did speak of that the Orthodox Church did have what were essentially called indulgences, um, what Eric called in this video, absolution certificates. Um, they did exist. They obviously did not persist. Um, I'm yet to read one where I could say this is really the same thing we're talking about in which theologically would have been the same thing. Because obviously, um, almsgiving has always existed. So without the paradigm of partial and plenary indulgence, some giving um, for alms, where, you know, the scriptures say to those who give alms, all thing, from, with, from what they have, all things are clean. That's what Jesus Christ said. Um, it would not be strange to someone then say, okay, you just gave a bunch of alms. Um, here's a piece of paper showing to the gospel, the gospel promise. Um, it really isn't a massive stretch. Um, again, until we start imposing these extra biblical, extra traditional categories of thought onto them. Um, also, again, being that there's been heresies in the Orthodox Church, um, we're not going to say at all times every practice we ever did was correct or accepted. Um, there was a long time where um, Hesychasm was in disuse. We have saints that actually wrote against it um, until pretty much before the Russian Revolution. And so there's different reasons for this, not stuff I can answer definitely in this video. But again, just because there's ebbs and flows and the purity of theology or certain doctrines at any given time, that does not mean that, oh, this means the Orthodox Church had the same exact view and this is a historic view. It just shows there's this aberrant view, maybe different rationale that persisted for some temporary period of time, just like other aberrant views, like iconoclasm and other things. Um, to unpack um, Eric's history, I really don't want to take the time to go into every single example. I will point out whether it's, let's say, Greg the Great saying that how um, works in behalf of the dead, um, attain to merit for the dead. I already addressed that when I spoke of what St. Ambrose said. It's not a very compelling answer if we want something mechanical, right? If we want exactly this, how God do this, Orthodox Church, and, and for that matter, St. Gregory the Great, doesn't give an exact answer. How does God, on a, a whim, become appeased and that appeasement have a certain 
non-calculable effect, but knowing the fact that it's going to help someone, we just don't know how much or exactly how, um, that's always been left unanswered by the church. It's been left unanswered um, by Jews in the first century, which had the same ideas. And so I think it's the Western idea to answer questions that we haven't been given answers to by the apostles that's led to these aberrant additional evolutions, these totally different creatures of doctrine. Um, another thing worth talking about would be how um, we're talking about the, uh, the part about martyrs and, and St. Cyprian and how they can vouch for people on their behalf. This is an, uh, something I've heard about actually um, uh, from Communio Sanctorum. It's a, it's a non-denominational Protestant who does a whole walk through church history. It's uh, relatively well done. It's not the greatest thing, it's not the worst thing. It's quite entertaining. I recommend it to anyone that wants something to listen to that goes through church history um, from a, it's not even totally a Protestant perspective. It's just some guy reading books telling me what he's learned. It's quite good. Um, but that being said, he talked about that issue, but that's as much as my exposure. I've read no primary sources on it specifically. So I do not doubt Eric, but I could say without, um, without more knowledge, I can't say what we have there would be more than someone vouching for someone else. And we see that in the scriptures. Uh, you know, Paul talks about uh, to the Corinthians that his letter of recommendations written on their hearts by the spirit, because obviously these letters existed. In fact, the Pharisees gave Paul a letter to do, um, to do things, let's say, to church, the synagogues in Antioch and to persecute the Christians. So this idea that uh, clergy and holy men could vouch for you, well, really would not be that strange. I mean, uh, my spiritual father vouched for me, for me to kind of pick the brain of, I, I won't say his name, but a certain monk who studies a lot of issues. I get to speak to him personally on matters, but someone had to vouch for me. So for someone to vouch for someone else and say, listen, through the righteousness of my life, I have the discernment that this person is sufficiently contrite and should be left back and put back into communion. That's relational. I don't see that as um, transactional. And that gets back to the problem which goes full circle of what we were talking about is that the Western view is always just transactional, you know, and while the Eastern view, I think intrinsically is about how, we, how are we conformed to the inter Christ, to his sufferings. And a lot of that is about a relationship with God and with his body, which is the church. And so that's why I can't say there's nothing that couldn't with enough um, if then if then if then enough syllogisms, make it into, okay, well, this is, could be analogous if we accept all these premises going on and on and on. Um, but that's to distance ourselves from the patristic consensus, from even what we've seen in Judaism and what the Orthodox Church affirms today. So that would be my response to those different points. Okay. Well, good. Um, Eric, maybe take about, uh, let's do about 10 minutes worth of a response, if you will, um, respond to some of the things that we heard from Craig, and then I will get to some of the questions from the chat, if y'all are, y'all are willing to take a few. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, he's right. It doesn't appear that the absolution certificates are the same thing that were used in the Orthodox church as, uh, the, the indulgence certificate that we would get today, for example. Um, with that said, though, he was asking for something analogous. So, um, and, and uh, he did mention that it had a transitory nature, that it was there and it kind of left. Uh, that wasn't the thinking of the bishops at Constantinople in 1727. They believed that that was part of the traditional teaching. And uh, like I said, Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, who is, a, you know, He's, he's no lightweight in the Orthodox Church, and I, I, I'm sure one would hesitate to, you know, besmirch his reputation as somebody who knows the historic tradition of the Orthodox Church. He himself didn't oppose it. In fact, he he actually per, he actually purchased one or, or was aiding someone to purchase one of these absolution certificates, uh, and, and that comes out quite explicitly. So, uh the other thing I want to say is this whole issue about conformity to Christ versus transactions. I, I just, I've never been able to understand this. Um, you know, the, the church fathers see both. It's very clearly for some reason. Uh, and I, I don't see this with uh, a lot of the Eastern literature, literature in the first millennium. And I don't even see it in uh, writings all the way up to 
like uh, Nilos Kabasilas, for example. I see this recently where there's this decry of, of uh, forensic satisfaction, uh, uh, for, uh, the, the talk about justice being transactional, even as a metaphor or, 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 or a, some sort of statement to correspond to a reality that it's, you know, not part of the orthodox, you know, not, not part of the patristic idea. Uh, I just, I can't see that. I, I, everything I've read in the patristics of Ambrose, Augustine, Chris Austin, especially, um, I see it all over the place. And it's very clear, the, the, the delineation, the distinction between the ontological conformity to the cross and to the resurrection, which like Philippians 3 talks about, you know, the, you know, the, the righteousness of God being alive from the dead, conformed to the, the, to the death of the Son of God. Um, but you also have side by side Chrysostom's statements on the liturgy, which talk about uh, vicarious uh, marriage on behalf of the, of the, of the deceased. And, and the idea is the deceased are there suffering. Uh, and he, he actually says that this could only benefit the, the, uh, those who die in the faith. Um, in fact, uh, Chris Ostom denies it for the, uh, the catechumens. And uh, just for those who died in the faith, uh, that they could be released from uh, their sufferings. Um, so I, I don't see that. I, I can't bear it out. I mean, I, I recommend anybody go read Chris Ostom, his commentary on Matthews, commentary on Romans. I mean, we can go through passage after passage. I, I have a link that, that goes through where he talks about satisfaction. Pope Leo the Great talks about, uh, you know, calculable satisfaction, uh, redeeming, being bought, you know, these things uh, come up. Now, I understand that sometimes there can be a, a misuse of these uh, metaphors, but uh, I, I just don't see how, I, I don't see how the, and I, again, I say it's modern because I don't read it really farther back than more than 200 years ago, this modern rejection of forensic satisfaction. I don't know where that comes from. Um, I mean, it's clearly in the Council of Jerusalem. If you read the Council of Jerusalem, uh, 1672, uh, there's a, a confession that, that, that goes, uh, belongs to Dositheus. Um, and it talks about the, the idea of vicarious satisfaction on behalf of the dead. I understand that the, the Orthodox would, you know, I sat down with a priest one time to, to talk about this and he just read this thing and I could see it on his face. He was like, this thing is just Western Latin. He just, it looked like he had pickle juice in his mouth. This is, this thing was just, you know, but um, you find corresponding statements in the Orthodox saints and the Byzantine scholars of the 14th century. Neolos Kabasilas, like I said, if you read Life in Christ, uh, he talks about the atonement in very, in, in categories and metaphors that uh, line up close to what we would say is perfectly legitimate and for which we are criticized today, reasons for which I know not. Um, the, uh, the other thing is this whole thing about the certificates from the martyrs being simply there to vouch for the, uh, the, the excommunicant. If you read the letters, like in Cyprian, it, it, it's very clear. They're not just talking about, hey, this guy can vouch for you. The idea is that these people are locked down by a necessity to satisfy for what they did. And so the only reason why their penance is shortened is because there's a satisfaction that can be um, replaced by the confession and merit of, of the martyr to supplant the demerit of the excommunicant. That comes out very explicitly in the language. The word satisfaction is used in relation to those certificates. Um, yeah, besides going and reading all this stuff, there's nothing much more I have to say. I have no, I, I mean, I, I don't want to bear down. I have books here. I can recommend a bunch of books. Uh, there's, if people want to read a book on the development of penance in the early church, um, I recommend this one here by Father Paul Palmer. Um, you'll have to pause the video if you're watching. 
Uh, it's called Sacraments and Forgiveness, History and Doctrinal Development of Penance, Extreme Unction and Indulgences, um, and uh, the Parable of the Talents in Matthew 25. Okay. If you want merit, merit's right there. If I could uh, add one comment, it's not a response, it's something I didn't touch on. I would just say, mm -hmm. um, especially for our Protestant viewers, um, when we think of penances, we have to think of, of them as almost something, one, the priest does to see whether we could partake the Eucharist um, in a worthy manner. Um, and so sometimes you need the time away from the Eucharist because you otherwise can partake worthily. And the other thing that it is, it's something that, for example, if you do have some, what's called in the West, venial sin, and, uh, you know, I don't know, I was disrespectful to my employee today, right? I'm probably not going to be barred from communion for confessing on Saturday. Um, something disrespectful come out of your mouth, that employee, when you do that, I want you to say something respectful, even if it makes you look silly right then and there. And so I'm just using it as a, as a potential penance. Now, I'm allowed to commune, yet I still have a penance and something I have to do, which again, it's the point is to heal me and sanctify me, make me more Christ-like. Um, and so to see these things as, okay, uh, almost like a credit card, right? You get this, you get what you want, the uh, sacrament now, and you, but now you own the credit card money, you got to pay interest. And that's the temporal effects of uh, buying the, the thing before you had all the money to purchase it. Um, again, that's possible. Being that credit cards work, um, I'm not going to say that's irrational, but... I just want to offer that other perspective for us to understand maybe these different uh, practices pertaining to penance. And I don't think they would have been new in the eighth or eighth century or whatever. I mean, I'm sure they were doing that at the beginning for venial sins. It was more the really major sins where there were super massive um, uh, penances, which obviously even now they're still pretty bad penances, but not like barred your whole life for some of the things that bar you for. Okay. Um, Eric, I have a question for you from traditional gentleman. Yeah. In the chat, he asks, what do Eastern Orthodox have to accept or believe in order to return to the Catholic church? Oh, wow. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, the first thing I think that the Orthodox would have to accept is the legitimacy of the filioque doctrine. Um, that is, you know, uh, paramount you know I, and i also think that the right and jurisdiction of the holy see uh yeah you know the, the the roman see as the final court highest tribunal in the church um who can exercise that jurisdiction uh in terms of doctrine morals and discipline so i think those two things would be uh, would really bring us back to our uh, pre-schism days. You would just essentially say, though, that those those are two of the main things. And so, for example, Eastern Catholics, they would accept that nothing else is required of them. Is that essentially what you're getting at? Um, well, we would need another reunion council, but if we were going to go back to the last talk on this or the last episode, it was the Council of Florence. So uh, we, they didn't manage to get to the doctrine of the indissolubility of marriage. It was stated explicitly at the council, but the Greek practice was not uh, addressed in particular um, directly. Uh, the issue of the essence and energy distinction in God, that was also tabled. Again, the emperor kind of disallowed it, uh, the discussion. Uh, that You had some you know, growling dogs at the council that wanted to talk about it but it, it didn't really come up. Um, the issue of indulgences, at the very least, the, the Orthodox Church would have to, um, you know, forbid any condemnations of the indulgences uh, as to whether they have to subscribe to it or start making their own indulgences. I don't think that's part of the plan. Um, but, that, you know, the filioque, papal supremacy, uh, purgatory, you know, again, we go back to this issue. I think we've, we've become far more generous in the way we explain it. And, um, 
you know, the issue of whether the fire is metaphysical, whether it's real, literal, and all that stuff. I think it's kind of that was kind of ironed out at, at Florence. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have the issue of uh, the beatific vision that might be a, an issue because of some of the statements that uh, Palamas and some of his uh, theological successors talked about where the, the essence of God is 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 beyond and unknown and we can't really say say anything about it much less see it, anything about it understand it at all um beatific vision is obviously a dogmatic teaching in the catholic church but i i think these are developments that really took place later and were not imposed on the east as much as the filioque and papal supremacy now if the whole thing of assigns is going to resurrect obviously florence uh that wasn't really a um the biggest issue there at Florence. Perhaps the epiclesis, the idea, uh, the prayer which invokes the, uh, the, the epicle of the Holy Spirit to transform the bread uh, and the wine. Um, again, that was solved at Florence, but again, uh, the many Greek theologians after Florence would resurrect that debate. And, and even I think as late as the 1800s, you had Greek patriarch uh, basically saying that this is a, a doctrinal divide on the epiclesis. So, but but the question is, what do we, th I would say the first thing would be filioque way, papal supremacy in the format of a reunion council. Okay. Um, Craig, I have one for you. This is from Elijah Yassi. He says, if the church fathers talk about our sufferings and tears and how they aid the dead, how do Eastern Orthodox look at those passages? I think simply they just appease God. Um, we don't know in what sense they appease him. And um, I don't think we could really say much more about that. Okay. Um, Eric, got another one from you from Destination Y. He says, if indulgences are not absolutely, I'm sorry, uh, let me read the first part because uh, I think he has, no, I read it right. It, it's a two part and it's kind of separated here. Um, if indulgences are not absolutely efficacious for the dead because of the binding being restricted to earth, how is it that the canonizations of saints are possible? They are not on earth. It says, whatever you bind on earth, talking about Matthew, um, are we binding saints? Obviously, this is to say that the binding occurs on earth, but the reality extends to the entire church, having, uh, heaven being infallible. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the promise was whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth. So the, uh, the, the space of binding and loosing is temporal. It's, it's on the earth. Um, so there's no binding in heaven that's valid on earth, for example, or, or loosing in heaven that's, that's loosed on earth. Um, the canonization of saints... Uh, this is not an area where I've looked in uh, too much. I know that if you go to Google and you type in Ryan Grant, uh, can the infallibility of canonizations, there's a going debate right now uh, in the Catholic Church, especially with the canonization of certain people who are uh, not above question. There are certain theologians in the Catholic Church as of right now who would say that uh, canonizations are, are not infallible because they are not an article of faith, for example, which I think is a bad argument, but the church hasn't really settled on it in any definitive manner uh, in that precise detail. But it, I think Ryan Grant gives the best, mo mo the most modern, the best and most succinct argument and how that relates to the powers of the church and her keys. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions from the chat. Let me also put in a plug since we're going to have Ryan Grant on the show. Uh, that will be September 16th. If anybody wants to tune in, uh, we're going to be talking about the myth of bloody Mary and her, uh, her reign as queen. So, uh, we'll be discussing that. Um, did y'all have any final thoughts that y'all wanted to address since I don't see any, uh, any other questions in the chat. So it's up for grabs. I, you know, I, I, I think that um, the, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to look into where the Orthodox Church went with the indulgence or their absolution certificates. 
I, I don't recall of any formal condemnation of them. And if if that were to be done, I'd like to know what they would say about an economy of the Holy Mountain. You know? Okay. Greg, any final thoughts? All right, I'm, I'm not on mute anymore. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we had a little I mean, bit of background noise. I had to put it on mute for a second there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd say, again, it's, I think the Western view of indulgences is kind of a mutation of trying to understand how God's grace works. So we really don't have all the answers. So I'm sure there are some listeners who just didn't like my answer. They appease God. We don't know how much or in what way, but that's the... That's the answer that we see. We don't see a, a bigger answer given by the Jews or the Christian, you know, the apostles or the church fathers. And uh, quite frankly, it's, a, it's an also an answer I've heard from an Orthodox bishop uh, and from a, a monk. Um, so it's not, um, it's something I hear consistently in Orthodoxy. You know, and I hear consistently is the West like, well, but this happened and this happened. That makes sense to that. And you know, there seems to be no governor in that train of thought. Uh, again, all my videos, I think there's an epistemological difference here. Um, I do want to make the comment also, though, um, we could go far too far and say there's no language of, um, of any commoditization whatsoever, anything to do with anything in orthodoxy, which is not true. Like, uh, we know with toll houses, um, I forget her name. I think it's also a St. Theodore, but I could be getting the name wrong. But in the story, you know, like the the prayers and good works are, I think, compared to money bags and stuff and paying the toll houses. I mean, even the word toll house has an inherently um, transactional sound to it. And that's the metaphor being employed. I think to really understand the Orthodox opposition requires understanding the Orthodox position, something we have not had time to unpack tonight, um, but I'm sure something uh, we'll be doing Reason Theology in the future, and I'll plug my own website, orthodoxchristiantheology.com. I have a four-part article on exactly that topic. We have one additional question. I, I don't know if we're going to take a stab at this one today. Uh, it's a very good one. Is Limbo of the Fathers still a place? Can people go to Limbo? Not the Limbo of Infants. So we have to deal with, of course, Abraham's bosom here, uh, whether or not that's still a place. And there's definitely going to be uh, some differences here between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy from what I've seen. I don't know if any one of y'all want to give a quick one I'll, I'll take this response. step at it. Um, yeah, okay, I don't go think ahead. The concept of limbo is really, I think it's actually much easier to come to terms with, I think, than a lot of the indulgence theology. Um, Orthodoxy essentially understands uh, salvation on a spectrum, just as first century Jews did, as well as they understood punishment as on a spectrum. And the source of both these things being the face of God, which is taken for granted in the scriptures, um, which I think actually came up in our video with uh, Dr. Price. Um, so that being said, if we're going to understand it on that spectrum, spectrum, limbo would just be the place in the middle. And I think when people go, well, the baby's suffering, are they not? It's kind of like, well, you're neither hot nor you're cold. You're not suffering. You're not benefiting. You're not, and if you're not being rewarded, then yeah, that's kind of bad, right? You have attorney, not with God. That's obviously bad. So I actually think the concept of limbo, though I wouldn't use the term, is actually trying to describe probably something pretty important, which is if there's a spectrum, there's got to be a, a middle point somewhere. And the question would be who would, who would be on that middle point? And uh, the unbaptized infants would seem like very good candidates for that. Eric, anything on that? No, nothing to add from what Craig said. That's fine. Okay. I think we could probably do a, a show on that another time because there's actually a lot that I want to dive in when it comes to that topic, especially with the development that we see among some Eastern Orthodox theologians indicating that an individual can come out of this place that they're in kind of this limbo state um, and perhaps be translated over into communion with God. So they could go from this limbo state where they're being damned to a uh, place where they are actually in communion with God, but this could only take place 
between the first and second judgment, the individual's particular judgment and the second coming of Christ and the final judgment. So I think that that would be an interesting discussion to have another time, but that we, we won't be able to really tackle that here. Uh, so I think we can maybe put that on the schedule. We had another uh, individual in the chat that was reminding us that we, we should do an episode on uh, different recommended readings and books that we would suggest to others. And maybe we can show the different books that uh, we have. Uh, right, I see right you got here. one. Of, wh which one is that? If you want to understand orthodoxy, this is the book. Okay. You don't really need to pick up another. It'll save you a lot of time. How, how um, big is this book? <laughs> it's probably the longest book in Orthodox history. It'll be really long. Pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the only thing I need to read on Orthodox. There I mean, go. The and, thick, and the bonus is you don't even need to own a Bible because he goes through yeah. the whole Bible. <laughs> so, oh, no. it, it, is that a hardback edition? Looks, looks like hardcover. Or is it paperback? Um, yeah, it's it's Law of God, Father uh, Daniel oh. Sezoyev. Again, nice. I keep plugging him because uh, he, he's a man who spoke with the authority of the fathers and uh, because that's just, he's regurgitating what has always been yeah. taught. And, and it's a great anecdote to a lot of the stuff we have in the English language from people that aren't from Orthodox, historically Orthodox countries, nor have um, withstood persecution, nor have been martyred. So it gives us a very good modern to the point take on Orthodox doctrines with a real patristic feel. So that's why I definitely recommend that book. Yeah, I, I need to get a copy. Maybe if um, individuals want, want to donate to help us get a better laptop so we can run it, uh, better programs with better features, we could probably put that on the uh, free gift you know, item that we could send to them. So it, it looks like a very good, very good addition to have in your library. All right, well, uh, like I said, now, I think that'll do it for today. We're right at one hour. So uh, we'll go ahead and cut it there. Everybody, please like, comment, subscribe, share this material. Uh, be aware that we're going to have Steve, uh, Professor Steve Weinkampf on the show tomorrow discussing the Crusades. After that, we're going to have Timothy Gordon on. Um, still haven't hashed out a topic yet, but I'll have that for you probably later tonight. So I'll put something on the Reason and Theology Facebook page. So take a look. Um, just add it whenever you get a chance and I'll have it there, but I think that'll do it. So everybody, uh, please, uh, like I said, share the material, God bless and go share your faith. <laughs>